Hello, and welcome back to the Self Wealth Real Estate Podcast with your host, Luke Boyer. Today, I'm interviewing Natalie Cloutier. Natalie is a real estate investor in the Ottawa area who has a different strategy. I haven't heard a lot of people doing this. She builds houses as investment properties, her and her husband, Rob, and uh, they've been doing this for years, have had a ton of success. Um, and it sounds like there's a lot of equity left in these properties that she gets and she's able to make them cash flow. Uh, so it's a really interesting strategy. She digs in. We talk a bit about construction tips as well on how to do that. Because I'm curious about that for my own business. And um, and we get into her best and worst deals. I think it's a really interesting episode. She has a different strategy that you don't otherwise see. So it's worth a listen. Take care. Today on the podcast, I have Natalie Coutier. Natalie, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. What an honor. Um, so let's talk about your background. How did you get into real estate and what did you do before real estate? Yeah. So, uh, our journey starts back in like 2013. We had just graduated from college. That's where my husband and I met. We met, um, we were studying architectural technology. So for those who don't know, that's like technical drafting for the architect. You're not the architect, you're like, you know, the CAD monkey, we call it. Um, so we studied that and then, uh, we had just graduated. We had no money, but we had just gotten jobs. I was really lucky. I had gotten a job in, um, as a, custom home designer for a small local firm. And my husband, Rob, wasn't as lucky. He wasn't able to get a job in the field right away. So he worked for my dad in minor renovation work. And then he would also do like uh, painting uh, contracts on the side. Um, so, you know, we were doing entry level salaries. We were doing OK, but uh, basically we were just young and in love and we wanted to live together. And it's funny because back in the day, in those days, Rob was living in a, like a student housing rental. And uh, he and his roommates were like the definition of the worst tenants. Like I'm talking <laughs> parties, bed bugs, never paying on time. Like, and it's ironic that now he's a landlord. Um, but anyways, yeah. So he wanted to get out of that situation, out of like the roommate party situation. So he moved in with me at my parents. I was still living with my parents. Um, and we just wanted to live together. So we thought we would just rent a, a house or, you know, a unit, something. And my mom was like, well, you know what? You're young. You just graduated. How about you? I'll... She wanted to set us up with her financial advisor to so for her to set up like a budget to see how much we can afford and all that. So we we did that. We sat with the, the advisor and I was really green. Like I didn't, my parents never talked about money or finances or ownership. So maybe because I didn't ask either, but they never volunteered the information. So I was green. I didn't know anything. And when I sat with the advisor, the first question I asked was, do you think it's better to rent or to buy? Like, that's how much I didn't know. And she's like, well, in my opinion, I think it's better to buy. And I'm like, okay, well, like, I can't afford that, right? Like, we can't afford that. We just graduated. And she's like, well, technically, yes, because, you know, you're a first time home buyer, which is really good. The government really tries to help the young buyers and you do have steady income. So I could probably put together an approval package for you. Um, oh, and, and prices were a little lower back then. Yes, it's 2013, so a little lower, but still, we were approved at 235. So, I mean, even even then, it didn't get you much, but it got you something if you were, like, in the outskirts of the big city. Um, so, we were, I was super stressed because I thought, you know, I thought we were just going to rent an old apartment, and now, all of a sudden, I'm buying something. Um, so, I really didn't want to hit the top of the budget, so we shot for, like, a basement unit condo. We bought it for 185000 uh, no down. So they did like a fancy trick with the government loan. It came with a bit of a higher interest rate, but we didn't have to put any money down and we were owners. So we bought that. And then fast forward three months of living there and we realized, wow, we are not condo people. It just wasn't for us. Um, too many neighbors living on top, too many, you know, opinions and eyes. And then you had the board meetings and the condo fees were already supposed to rise. So we were a little discouraged and um, we were back at my parents and my mom just was just like, okay, well, you know what? I think it's time you knew the truth. And that was like my big aha moment. And I don't know if like when you're a kid, I don't know if this is just me, but I had dreams where like, oh, or fantasies maybe where like my, my mom would say, okay, you know what? We're secretly rich. We just didn't want to tell you because we wanted you to be humble. I don't know if like every kid had that fantasy or if it was just me, but it kind of felt like that because it's, it's not what happened, but it was basically what she told me was basically like the ticket, my ticket to freedom because it's what we based our entire strategy on. And she said, well, you know, you can build your house for for zero dollars down. And I was like, what? And she's like, yeah, that's what, you know, your dad and I did uh, before you were born. We built four houses in four years. So they would build, sell, build, sell, build, sell until eventually she got pregnant with my sister. And then they built the house that they still live in today, their forever home. But yeah, she said, that's what we did. It's called an auto construction loan where you can basically build your house 
uh, for zero dollars down and you just have to put money yeah not money sorry you have to put like your skills at work right so you have to do actual physical work and you put your DIY skills um, and you you replace I, your I mean you don't have to in theory you could build you could pay a contractor to build but there just probably wouldn't be enough money in it right so that's the thing so the the purpose of this loan it's called an auto construction loan and it oh, usually it actually is, is for building yourself it, it is exactly yeah so it's built it's made so that you put in you essentially replace your down payment with your sweat equity so for easy math let's say the plans were approved for like a hundred thousand dollars they were appraised for that they'll say okay well we'll lend you eighty thousand dollars and it's up to you to build it for that amount so you have to get in there do work yourself so that you save that that balance right so um so that's what we did um but it's funny because when she was telling me the story i was like okay mom i went from thinking i was going to rent an old apartment to all of a sudden three months later I'm building my own house that's like super mind-blowing to me and it's nice that I can use this loan to build the thing but then how am I going to be able to afford the mortgage payments on the thing right because at that point uh, Rob was switching jobs he had gotten a job as an estimator but it didn't pay a lot he'd paid like thirty thousand dollars a year so it, it wasn't much and I'm like you know we still have to pay the expenses and, and everything so she said, oh, yeah, but don't worry, we're going to, you know, the way you do it is you design the house to have a basement apartment in the future to help pay for expenses. So and we were what? We were 19 at the time when she was telling all this, when she was telling this. So we were like, oh, my God, this is super cool. Uh, so we did it. We we built our house. We uh, put in a basement apartment about a year after. And then um, that's where we found out that we had built an equity in the house. And uh, we had we were able to pull out like a forty thousand dollar HELOC. Um, and so like a year after that, there was this, um, this property, this piece of land that was for sale for a while. And it was like a problem lot where nobody knew what to do with it. And Rob looked at it and he's like, you know what? I think we could build something. We could put our design, like our architectural skills to good use and we could figure something out. And with the job I had as a designer, I was able to pull like, um, a couple of designs from like our archives and see like, could I use this footprint and change it and make it fit? And so we did it. We bought the lot. We built it, um, figured out how to get financing. And then we realized it was like a formula for a business. So we kept going. And it was only until like a couple years later that I started listening to podcasts and realized that house hacking was a thing. And that's what we did. And, you know, investing was a thing. And that's what we were doing. I didn't. And it took me like a, a year or two to put everything together that this was um, a legit thing. So, yeah, uh, fast forward to today. And now we have uh, a where we're closing in on nine million dollars worth of real estate. Uh, so yeah. And how many properties is that across? Uh, so that is across. We have eight properties, um, and two of them are, two, uh, three of them are vacant lots for future builds. Um, so is it eight properties or is it seven? Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's seven or eight properties because that's the thing. It doesn't sound like a lot of properties, but new construction has such a higher value than older homes so you don't need as many properties to reach you know a higher net worth or a higher um a portfolio value so yeah yeah and, and you can get pretty good rents for the new properties too exactly yeah so and you and, can build conservatively you can have decent cash flow and a decent net worth right so and and, and i've seen what you guys build and you guys do a good job it's, it's nice stuff so yeah. thanks yeah um it sounds like an amazing strategy why don't more people do it it's hard work. And you know what? It's a complex process to understand. It's not everybody knows, like building can be very um, overwhelming, right? So you have to have someone who's willing to kind of teach you and guide you through it. Um, so you can probably ask for help for someone or you can even maybe try uh, working for a builder where you can learn hands-on um, or, you know, you just throw yourself in it and you figure it out. That's I know what we did, but our dad guided us through our own house uh, and then we figured out the rest. But I I have friends who just threw themselves in it and figured it out on the fly. I'm not saying that's the smartest thing to do, but it's definitely an option. You too uh, is your friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So and so that's why like I, I read like a, I, I wrote like a guidebook on that, on like trying to not necessarily dumb it down, but I am not the type of person that's going to speak in very complicated terms or in code. So I say it as I understand it. And so I wrote a book that's kind of like just an easy way to understand the process. Um, because, yeah, it is it is a bit overwhelming, but it's doable. You just have to have the right systems in place, hire the right people. And, you know, once you've done one, you can do you can do several. Right. So um, what's the name of the book and where can people find it? 
Oh, it's uh, it's the build and hold uh, strategy, and uh, it's on my website or through my Instagram. Uh, my website is um, thenewbuildcouple.com, and my Instagram is at thenewbuildcouple, and there's a link in there, and you can can find the book through that. Um, <clears throat> so are you still, for your build, still getting an auto build loan? Uh, so now it's different. So an auto construction loan is more of a thing you do for your primary residence and like your personal side, right? So now that we are more commercial lending, it's still essentially the same, um, the same structure, but it's done a little differently. So the way you have to do it now is, well, especially today with the, um, the approval, like is, is a bit harder because the interest rates are so high that it's, you know, it's a little different, but, um, basically you have to put down 20%. Um, so either you buy the land or you start the construction, you progress it to a certain stage and then the bank will come in and kind of refund you that afterwards. So you, you have to get the ball rolling mm-hmm. yourself and put in money yourself. So you have to have like a line of credit or maybe even a private lender. And, and that's specifically for the rentals. If someone were to do an auto build. Yeah. Like sorry, auto construction do, or auto build, what do you call it? Uh, auto construction loan. Okay, auto uh, construction loan. If someone yeah. were to do that for their primary, they could still do it with very little down or, or Yes, you can still do it. Now, again, I don't know. This this was back in 2013, 2014 when we built our house. Rules so have changed a bit. But, rules yeah. have probably changed. Although my cousin, just we just built his house. Like We helped him build his house just uh, beside ours um, in 2020. He built during COVID. So it, I think it was a little bit harder to qualify, but he still managed and he still did it. So uh, he also did the whole basement apartment thing uh, and then the HELOC at the end. So it's still doable. It's like I, people are doing it. Just got to find the right to like uh, credit unions are the, sometimes the best places for that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's a ton of value. I mean, I don't really do new builds. I guess the closest I've built a couple coach houses and okay, yeah. it's essentially very similar. I mean, you need to meet all the same requirements. You got to hook up your plumbing and sewer and, yeah. um, you need an HRV and a heat source and, you know, yeah, I would say, though, that the more complicated thing is more, um, you know, finding the lot, the zoning, and then, like, getting your, um, like, right now we're designing the next triplex. It's a bit complicated because the lot is on a hill. So we're trying to figure out, like, the grading levels and, like, we're probably going to have some step footings in that and have, like, a walkout basement unit. And so there are some things that can be more complex. We have to build, like, a retaining wall to support the neighbor's garage that's, like, falling down. Um, but because we're moving the ground, we have to do that, right? So. Um, there's a few things that can be more, a lot more complex, but again, if you yeah. have the right team of civil engineers and, uh, the right people who know what they're doing, like we have a, a meeting with them at two 30 with the civil engineers to figure out how we're going to do the grading on that lot. So you have to rely on the professionals, right? But, uh, you yeah. still have to have a bit of a basic understanding on how you're going to execute the, that builds once it's all drawn up. Yeah. I, I, I always like to say that, um, everybody has some sort of superpower. When it comes to real estate investing and you have to figure out what yours is and maybe your superpower is that you just have a lot of cash yeah and so you can get one of these loans and you can front the money and you can pay a contractor to do it and it'll still work out right yeah um there's different you know maybe your superpower is, is finding lots or being able to get things rezoned finding opportunities that way maybe your superpower is being able to build cheaper than others or renovate cheaper than others so yeah. there, there's always um I, I would say one of my biggest strength is getting good deals on properties right but I do find renovation so important, especially since I, I'm kind of opportunistic in my buying. So I get a wider range of condition of properties. I have houses where the roofs burnt off, and you know, and Fine. the foundation issues, and just all kinds of, and sometimes it's cosmetic or heavily smoked and cat pee hoarders. So being able to handle the renovation side, of, I find, is so important. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, that's mostly renovations, but some of them are pretty close to rebuilds, and. Yeah. I find that such a useful skill and talent that a lot of people should be nurturing if they're able to, you know, depending on their day job and things like that. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's one of the ways to add a lot of value these days on properties. Construction costs have gotten so expensive that it can easily derail a project. You can get a good deal on a property, but way overspend on renovations Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 lose on the project or have a have a loss like have a bad project come out of it so i i I always used to say i still feel this way a bit is you make your money on the buy and then on construction it's just don't screw it up Mm -hmm. um but i do think if you're really really good at the construction and the renovation it can be you can buy an average deal and make up for it on the construction and i do find even in ottawa we flip houses right uh my company and we're able to buy some stuff sometimes on the MLS because 
we have confidence in taking on some construction issues at a lower cost than other people on the market see it. Um, you know, we, we take on one house and they're getting quoted a hundred grand because of the foundation issues. And we think we can take care of it for 20. Yeah. That's a huge savings, $80,000 difference. And that might be what gets us a 50 to $80,000 profit margin on the property, whereas someone else wouldn't, they wouldn't make money on it. Right. So yeah, I, I think there's huge value in the construction side. Um, since I am interested in this for my personal use, I want to ask you a few questions about what you're building, what they look like. So um, if you were to take a lot, let's just say more of a generic lot, an easy one, mm -hmm. um, would you be building a triplex on it nowadays? Uh, it depends on what the lot can fit. If the lot can fit more, do it up. Let's say more. let's say a typical lot that can fit a triplex. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one question I have is, can you usually fit th three parking spots side by side or how do you figure out the parking? So again, back, so here, like in uh, where, where I am, the municipality has these strict guidelines on the parking. You have to have like, you, you can only, your driveway can only be seven meters wide and you have to, you can't branch out wider until you've hit six meters from the front setbacks and you have to have two parkings per uh, unit. So you have to fit six parkings. And so if the lot is smaller, um, it can still be doable, but parking is usually the biggest challenge, especially when I worked as a designer and I would do these development projects are these, um, yeah, these development projects in Ottawa, um, where it was more strict. Um, I find that the parking was always the, pro the, the part of the project that would kind of slow us down until we figured it out. So, but I always tell people, don't forget that there's always the, um, there's always the option of doing a minor variance, right? You can do minor variance applications. And, uh, so, so the best thing to do when you're looking at a property is to get a, um, a pre consultation with the municipality. So before you buy, you can go under contract with the property and say, put it on a condition, have your realtor put in a condition that um, protects you, that says that you're going to do a pre-consultation and uh, it's based on the outcome. Like the outcome has to be satisfactory to you, the buyer, um, in order to say yes or no, you're going to buy the property. So try to do a pre-consultation with the municipality. The thing is that sometimes it can be a couple of weeks before you even get in. So it's really important to have uh, contacts with the city agents directly. Like I have they know me, they know us now. And I call them and there's this one guy I'll just call and he'll answer and he'll give me information right off the bat. Um, and then uh, plus they're a little bit, they're not as busy this year as they were the years before during COVID. Um, so it's a bit easier to get in. But yeah, I do the pre-consultation, tell them exactly what your intention is for the projects. Don't hide anything because I know people who, oh, I don't want to tell them this, they're going to charge me more. No, no, no. Tell them what you want to build. Be open with them because they will find out if you were being dishonest and that will tarnish your reputation if you're trying to do more in the future, right? So mm -hmm. straight up, tell them, I want to do a triplex. What do I have to do? What are their requirements? If I were to request a minor variance to make the parking work, would you think that would be accepted? Do you have any opposition to this? So ask them all the questions. And in my book, I have a checklist of all the questions to ask. Um, so, but yeah, I think it's the first step that's really important. You have to make sure that you can build what you really want to build on it. And very often, like we, there's a lot that can seem very simple, very straightforward. And by the end of the pre-consultation, you're like, oh, wow, there's like a whole bunch of hidden things that I I didn't know that they will they will bring out from the zoning bylaws. Maybe there's even an easement going above it that you didn't notice. You know, there can be different things. So you have to, I think pre-consultation is like the most crucial step. Um, and that's much easier in kind of smaller cities on the outskirts because, you know, like we're, we're in the Ottawa area and the city of Ottawa itself is pain in the ass. I got a, yep. a severance done on a property in Ottawa and it took a year. It was allowed as of right. We just like the lot sizes fit. There's no minor variances required, but neighbors came up and complained and there was all kinds of issues. The city required us to do an environmental yep. assessment on the property, which cost an extra five grand because the former owner used to change his oil in the backyard of the motorcycle. Oh and the neighbors are like, well, it's contaminated. They don't make you do ESA inspections yeah. For residential properties to oh, build it's a single commercial. townhouse is what we would be building. Like it's crazy. Yeah. But the committee of adjustment can essentially do whatever they want. So yeah, in some municipalities it can be harder than others. In smaller ones, they tend to be well, I mean, you can speak to them and find out if they're nice people or not. <laughs> but they tend yeah. to be a little more accommodating. But that's what I mean by having good contacts. Because when I yep. worked for that uh, designing firm before, I worked there for five years, they knew us, right? Especially depending on which branch. Like we would go sometimes to the Orleans branch and they would know us maybe a bit more than 
Well, actually, no, we go to downtown Ottawa pretty often, the one on, on Nohi. Um, and yeah, like y- the thing is that there's a lot of turnover because it's such a big, um, s- you know, there's a lot of staff, right? So there's there's some turnover, but there were a few that they knew us and we would go in and ask for questions and you just, you can go to the city directly, bring your site plan, bring your plans and ask them your questions. Yeah. And that can get you at least some preliminary answers and then obviously follow up with an email, try to have it in writing as much as possible. So, but anyways, I think that that's why connections are super important. But you're right. I Like I said, I've dealt with the city of Ottawa. It is a huge pain in the ass and why I don't invest in the city of Ottawa. I try to avoid it like leprosy. Like I don't want to deal with it anymore. Yeah. Uh, and I think your point about putting in a condition to review that first is is good. And it might be harder on a, on a house, on a regular house, right? That's for sale. They may not be as flexible with allowing that. But on a lot or something that's you know expected to be a teardown, they're going to be much more understanding of needing to understand the requirements. And it's much more likely you can get something like that approved. Or you could even just word it as a due diligence condition. You know, I have yeah. two weeks to do due diligence, right? 10 business days. Yeah, um, exactly. And they're much more likely to accept the condition like that. Exactly, uh, yeah. So I think that's good. Um, so let's say, okay, so, uh, and I was going to comment. I, I have uh, a raised bungalow in the in same city as you invest in. Okay. And I, uh, when I did the basement conversion to make it a legal duplex, I ran my plumbing and my drain to the back wall. Um, what I love about this house is I think it has a 75 by 150 foot lot backs onto a park. Oh, nice. And on the left side in front of the garage, it has a double wide asphalt driveway. Okay. That can fit two cars deep. So it fits four cars. On the right side of the house, there's a gravel driveway that drives all the way to the backyard. So I have two driveways. (laughs) Like it's, yeah. Oh, I, I, before they allowed coach houses, this was at least two years ago. Um, I think they now have to allow coach houses. I haven't seen, I think December they were doing their bylaw review. But anyways, I, in the, at some point, I plan on building a coach house in that backyard. So yeah, we'll absolutely. Those. I, may, I may reach out for help. But for sure, yeah, it'll be fun. <laughs> um, so, okay. So you've figured out parking. You're building a triplex. What size units are you typically building? Uh, so I, it, again, depending on the size of the lot, if you can fit more bedrooms, you can get more in rent and it'll also help your um, a, appraisal, right? Your value. So the triplex we're doing right now are two bedroom units. Um, they're a bit smaller. There was a very tight lot. So it's two bedroom, one bath. And um, they are a bit harder to rent because I find that there was an, in, like most builders will go and build two bedroom units because it's just easier and it's just like standard. I do find one bedrooms and three bedrooms rent better than two bedrooms. Yep. I mean, yeah. Because there's just too many two bedrooms on the market there. I find that there's just too many of them. So, uh, but the thing is, if you were to build like a triplex of just one bedrooms, likely your appraisal won't cover your construction costs because your rents won't be as high, right? So yeah. if you look at the triplex we're doing now, the rents are like at about 1900 a month. Um, so the construction costs, we have to leave money in the deal in this one because it, technically their rents aren't, at, because especially of the interest rates being so high, you're not, your approval yeah. rating isn't the same, but still, um, so it's especially important when interest rates are high that you have to make sure that you can have the highest rents possible um, without having turnover every couple of months because it's just too high, right? You still have to be reasonable and within your market, um, what what it's worth. So, but if you can do like the next triplex, the one with like the the different grading that I was talking about, those are going to be three bedroom units, and those are going to rent. I know they're going to rent like hotcakes. They're going to go really fast, and we can probably get twenty one hundred for them. So I know that the construction cost is going to be a little bit more than the one we're doing now, where there are two bedrooms especially because of the grading, it's a bit more complicated, but the loan should be a lot better too because the rents are higher, so your value is higher, right? Yeah. What um, what size are the two-bedroom units and what size would you make the three-bedroom units? Like um, three-bedroom. Square feet. So I think they're about a, maybe less than a thousand square feet, the two-bedroom units, maybe like 950. Um, okay. So we, yeah, so we always try to have like a master bedroom that fits a king-size bed or, you know, close to with a bit of a walk-in closet or at least like a double his and her standard size closet. That's mm-hmm. kind of the thing like people are look, they, people look for. And then um, these ones too, we do electric heating. So heat pump and yep. baseboard heaters at secondary source. So because of that, you need less space in terms of the mechanical room. You don't need a big furnace room and all that. So you still have an HRV and a hot water tank to put in, but that fits in like a little closet. So we have a little closet that's just for mechanical. And then we had a look. And are these heat pumps ductless mini splits or? Yes, exactly that. Yeah. Have you so, ever looked into doing P-Tax? 
What's the, like, that? kind of under the window ones you see in hotels through the Oh, wall. no. I've never looked into doing that. But are they as efficient as ductless? There are some that are heat pumps and there are some that are just resistance oh. heat. Okay. I so if know. you get the heat pump ones, they're, I believe, as efficient. I mean, they're right through the wall, so it's direct. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm not aware of those. I, I HVAC is not my, my the, forte. The reason That's... I like them is because you can install them yourself. Okay, yeah, yeah. So you're no longer relying on, you know, you, you install a metal sleeve in the wall as long as your framing supports it. Yeah. And then you just slide it in. And if there's a problem with it, you pull it out, you put a new one in, right? Yeah. Um, and it plugs in. So It's pretty much the same as a ductless red mini split because that's what Rob is installing them himself too. Oh, okay. He is installing them. Okay. Yeah. Like, so my crew doesn't install ductless mini splits ourselves. Okay. We, install, we, we can install eight PTACs ourselves. They're okay. They're really simple to change, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't put them in the bedroom. So I, I do those in kind of smaller units. Um, right. So that's like the main heat source for the whole thing. But yeah. then I would have secondary in other places. I just find it, it's good that you guys installed them yourselves. I find getting heat pump ductless mini splits installed very expensive. Okay. Um, right. Like very, very expensive. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh, we, we buy them and then we Rob installs them with his right. uh, his yeah. employee. But uh, what do you do for a secondary store? Do you do baseboard heaters? Usually, yeah. So yeah. The, the example I can think of is by... So, I did do ductless mini split in my first coach house. My second one uh, with uh, the bathroom had actually heated floors, which was nice because it was oh, yeah. lab on grade. That's cool. I was kind of playing around different construction types. The second one, I did uh, helical piles for the foundation. Okay. It's in the backyard of a house in uh, Elmville Acres, like Alta Vista type area Okay. in, in Ottawa. And uh, it's 420 square feet. It's nice. It, it has like vaulted ceilings. Like it peaks up in the middle because we just followed the roof line. Um, 420 square feet, one bedroom, um, bathroom has a baseboard heater, and then the the wall over the bedroom is open, so the main heat source is just a PTAC in the living room. Oh, nice. And then the bedroom has a backup baseboard heater if needed, but the okay, PTAC yeah. is the main heat source. And I mean, it's spray foam insulated, it's small, it doesn't take a lot of energy to keep that thing warm. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And 420 square feet, uh, I rent it for 1750 plus hydro. Oh, nice. Okay, that's good. So, like, yeah, really good. That, yeah. I like building the small ones in mm -hmm. part because I might not have as good control on construction costs as you do. Mm -hmm. So for me, building 950 square feet for a two bedroom, that would be probably too expensive for me to make work. I would try to squeeze 650 square foot two bedrooms. Okay, okay. Which are harder to rent. I'd get a little less than you, but it's then more affordable than any other two bedrooms that are new. So it's yeah, it's a less rent than you would get, but. Not bad rent for the size. It's still very good rent. So Absolutely. proportionate construction costs. But uh, yeah, it it's impressive that you guys... too, right? Like if, if in Ottawa, there's more demand. But you know what? I had a call just this morning. Some guy called me at like 8 a.m. He's like, yeah, I'm looking for something. And I had put a sign for rent for those that triplex. And I told them the rents and how big they were. Like, oh, that's too big for me. I'm just looking for something small. But it's not something that I would get often being in the outskirts of Ottawa. I find that people look for a little bit more space. So we were always trying to accommodate for more space. Um, but yeah, I could see that getting closer to the city or maybe even now it's getting a little bit more, well, things are more expensive. So people are looking for a uh, smaller size unit. So yeah, it's I think I the larger units, you might find longer term tenants and families that want to stay there longer, Yeah, which is a good thing, less turnover, um, and more likely people who afford it and want to want to afford it. The small ones, it's more people who are just looking for, for a place. Even again, the two coach houses, one's 450 square feet, one's 420 square feet. We... You know, our applicants were like new teachers, new nurses, like um, uh, someone, one of the applicants that was good was uh, in the military and he was only stationed in Ottawa part-time. So he just needed kind of a crash pad and then he had a family home somewhere else. So, uh, but I think, I think one of our tenants is a teacher who's, you know, first or second year of teaching and another one's a nurse who's a couple of years out of nursing school. So it's kind of, they're starting their careers and they just want a small place for themselves um, and yeah, and they like it because it's newly renovated, right? Yeah, exactly. You're you're targeting a certain demographic, and that's that's perfect. Yeah, when you know your different... demand for both. Yeah, in uh, in different ways, and the price reflects it. Obviously, if you build smaller, you'll get less rent. If your construction cost is good, which mm -hmm. it sounds like yours is, you can justify getting um, the the extra construction cost for the extra rent you get. With my construction cost being higher, it makes sense for me to build smaller, and uh, the, the proportionate amount I'm saving in construction cost relative to the slight decrease in rent is worth it for me. Yeah, to build. exactly. So, yeah. Um, and so how big would a three-bedroom be for you? 
Uh, so those, oh, I don't remember the square footage on those, but I believe they're about, they're not that much bigger. They might be close to 1,200, maybe 1,100. So it's uh, three bedrooms and one and a half bath. So there's like a small two-piece ensuite in the master bedroom and then like okay. a full-size um, uh, we, we try to keep it to just like a shower tub combo we do, we used to do like a bath a shower but we always had troubles with the showers there was always something yeah. leaking and so rob was like i'm done with it it's shower tub combos and it is what it is and that's what they're getting because it's just less maintenance so no i agree um, the tubs are the best they're, yeah yeah i mean yeah it the the tub has a nice lip to hold your shower curtain in so it doesn't leak exactly right? yeah, yeah. So, so we tr we try to keep it simple, and uh, yeah. So I think they're like a, maybe eleven fifty square feet. That that that's a really good size. It's impressive. I mean, I flip a lot of a lot of uh, bungalows in Ottawa and the outskirts, right? Like, I just sold one conditional last weekend. It's a thousand twenty five square feet. Yeah. On the main floor, and they have the basement as well. So that one's you know three right. bed, one bath upstairs, and uh, a bedroom, big rec room, utility room, and a powder room in the basement. But yeah, it's pretty typical that. My bungalows I flip are like a thousand to twelve hundred square feet, and we do a lot of those. So, yeah, you're making big units. It, it's yeah. nice, it's nice family units. Now, would you ever go to a four bedroom? Uh, no, I don't think I would, because I've never considered it to be honest. But it just feels like more of a single family home vibe, um, and it is good. Single family homes can be good for people who like if you if you have like um. Uh, two families who want to live together or like like we had a situation where we had a tenant moving out because his daughter recently separated um, and so in order for her like not to lose the house he's going to move into her basement and help pay for expenses so they're, they're going to be not well they're, it's not her house I think they're I think they ended up renting a house I'm not really sure of the situation but it can be helpful for when there's two families come like pulling their income together and paying for like one big rent um, I just prefer multifamily because obviously more rent under more uh, under one roof so try to keep the roof as small as possible and still have a lot of units in so no we don't do four bedrooms um three bedrooms is our max because it already like a three bedroom you'll get a lot of people like big families they're going to try to squeeze into that three bedroom like you can have really large families looking for houses and it's like at a certain point you have to put an occupancy limit or else it just gets out of hand right um so and then you have more complaints from the other tenants and yeah 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 so um so no i think three would be my max yeah. And I mean, you're not in an area that's necessarily student geared as well. Nothing I mean, necessarily want students, but I do have, I did do one duplex in Ottawa. It's near Algonquin College. Okay. And it's each, I did, it's a semi-detached bungalow and each unit has four bedrooms. Okay. Yeah. And one and a half baths upstairs, two baths in the basement. Um, we fit a lot into like, it's probably 1200, 1300 square feet. So nice. put a lot into it. Um, but yeah, because it was near Algonquin College, it justified you know, we're going to be renting it to students. It makes exactly. sense to have that, but yeah. you don't necessarily want a group of, you may, you may end up also not only large families trying to cram in, but also, um, a bunch of like friends cramming in together and that gets messier too, right? Yeah, exactly. But you're right though. If you if you had a demographic for a student rental, then yeah, definitely five, six bedrooms, you know, and that's, that's a whole other ball game though. It's a different yeah. investing strategy completely. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Are you a savvy real estate investor looking to maximize your profits? Well, if you're buying properties off the MLS, you're not making as much as you could. The most lucrative way to boost your bottom line is by acquiring investment properties off market. By buying privately off market, you're able to save tens of thousands. Now, the problem is finding off market properties is really hard and takes a lot of time, effort, and money to do. Bliss is your number one source, delivering exclusive deals that you will not find on the MLS directly to your inbox. Bliss's extensive network and insider connections gives you access to properties that are not publicly listed and at a discount. We've helped hundreds of investors across Ontario and BC source the right properties at the right time for their portfolio. Buying assignable purchase contracts through Bliss at a discount, helps facilitate higher returns, lower competition, and deals that align perfectly with your investment goals. From start to finish, Bliss's world-class team of real estate professionals makes the process seamless for all investors. If you're ready to elevate your real estate investment strategy, visit us at offmarketbliss.ca to join our buyers list and start receiving exclusive off-market deals directly to your inbox. The most profitable opportunities await 
and they're exclusive to you and our valued buyers list members. For your next project, check out Bliss, the go-to source for off-market deals. Awesome. Uh, okay, any tips for building cheaper? Uh, for building cheaper, yeah. I mean, you have to sit down with your designer. So for us, you know, you were talking about your um, your superpower. For us, our superpower is the fact that we can do our own plans, right? So just just last night, Rob was thinking about that triplex with the grade and and he was like, you know what? I think I have an idea of how I can make the grades more simple. So like after a kid went to bed, he just went on the laptop and really kind of figured out the design and I sat with him. And so for us, that's our superpower of of doing our designs. But if obviously not everybody has that. So if you're sitting with your designer, the first thing you need to tell them and is to make sure that the build is simple. The roof scheme is simple and <clears throat> you don't need fancy construction systems, mechanical systems to be simple. You know, you just have to follow the KISS rule, like keep it simple because you can have designers who will put in um, just too much, too much in the specs, too much in the construction, like in the walls, they can put more than you need to. So you just need to tell them, like communicate clearly that your needs are for a simple, basic construction that is comfortable, that is up to code, and that will still test, like stand the test of time, uh, but that's not going to cost you 20, 30%. Like ICF buildings, don't do it. It's not worth it. It's 30% more on all your trades across the board because they have to drill through the cement and the insulation. Like to me, it is not worth it for a single family home, especially uh, for a rental. Sorry, it, it could be uh, worth it for a single family home, but it's not worth it for rental properties, especially if you're uh, passing on the utility expenses onto them, right? What's the point in building um, that much more? So it's all about just keeping the design simple, the roof scheme and all that. And um, what else? Uh, you know, try to open accounts with um, like your local lumber yard. So tell them you're a contractor. Try to get usually if you open up like a contractor account, you can get like a 10% discount or you can get stuff uh, that will really help have them do have them um, have a couple lumber yards do a takeoff off the plans and see it's very hard though to compare estimates from one lumber yard to the next because they won't always do the takeoffs the same way. So it's not exactly comparing apples to apples. But if you have the time to sit down and review your estimates and stuff and re review everything to make sure that it, it, you are comparing apples to apples, then you can get a couple quotes uh, and work with that. But um, and the nice thing about that kind of thing is you typically only have to do it a couple times. Yeah, because once you've compared the lumber yards and their price and their discounts, you just know which one to go to the next time, and usually. You know, maybe every few years you you double check for sanity, make sure it still makes sense. But uh, yeah, that, that's and, a nice and it's also set up on it exactly. And it's also about setting up that relation with that contractor and whatever, well, not that contractor, but that supplier, and making sure that if like sometimes like we'll deal with like the Rona here, and then if um, we're just used to it because it's simple, right? So we'll call them, they know us, okay? It, like we get free delivery sometimes. So, um, but like if you're if you're constantly going back and forth with another place and oh I can get a better price maybe at Home Depot but then by the time they ship it and then it, that's if they ship it on time the last time I had a bath shipped over it didn't come on time the guy didn't want to leave it and anyways I had to call him so that was like more complicated and not worth my time for if I maybe paid $200 more for that same tub at Rona but it would have been delivered you know so sometimes you just looking for simplicity what's the quickest way to get your supplies on site um but yeah those relationships are important too you're gonna you're gonna eventually get to know which trade and which supplier um makes easier for you yeah i do find rona a little more expensive and mm -hmm. i know the runner you're talking about it's a little on the smaller side they don't it have is the best selection yeah. not, not always but for us it's the relationship that counts and they yeah. make it simple and they make it easy we know who to call they like you know we'll, we bought them pizza during the holidays like we go hang out with them nice. it's just so for us, that's what works. And that's Rob was also an estimator for them. That's like he worked there for three years until eventually he uh, became a full-time real estate investor. So the relationship was always built in. Um, yeah. but there is a nice lumber store in your town. There is, yeah. Yeah, I, I like that place. Yeah. Um, you store it from them. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with the, the tip about keeping your design, uh, working with your designers, because I find it's something people don't seem to understand. And that's definitely, I think one of your superpowers too, is you're able to kind of combine understanding the costs and the way of building things with your design expertise, because like I'll ask the designer to design something and I'll go, oh man, this is going to cost too much to build. Why don't yeah. we do it this way or that way? Or sometimes we approved plans, we start building, we're like, oh, why did we have to do this? Now it's going to add a cost or they spec out something that's above the requirement. And I'm like, couldn't we have spec this out this way? Yeah. And I have to go back to them. Either do with a more expensive way or pay them again to do a revision. Yeah. 
the spec in a different way. That's why it's super crucial to voice those concerns when you're doing your initial meeting. You tell them, like, we're looking for simple, cheap. You don't necessarily want to be that cheap builder that's cutting corners. That's not what I'm saying. You don't have to cut corners. You just have to make sure that they're not over specking stuff. That's, you know, you're, you're, you're following code. You're doing what needs to be done. Uh, but you don't have to get fancy with it. And so especially when I was talking, you know, simple roof schemes, that's one of the things where very often they can get really complicated with the roof schemes and that can cost a lot. So, you know, low hip, um, simple, you don't have to build like a straight box that looks boring, but actually you could, as long as the front, you can work with the textures and the materials and make it look nice still. Right. So, um, so yeah, it's just really important to voice that because or else they, if they don't know, they're, they're going to do what looks nice. Right. So as a designer, I know I used to do the things that look nice and then eventually I understood the construction cost behind it and it just didn't make sense. Yeah. But so, so many designers don't get it. And I mean, mm-hmm. sometimes the layouts, I think it's a little bit more simple when you're building from scratch than trying to renovate. Like yeah. whenever I do duplexes, I try to make sure my bedrooms are under my bedrooms, my living rooms under my living room, my kitchen's under my kitchen Yep. in, in part for noise transfer, you know? Usually yeah. people sleep in their bedrooms and then they're not making noise. You don't want a living room above a bedroom and then uh, yeah. you know, people aren't sleeping and they're complaining. L- longevity makes it easier. Um, but also things like, I imagine your triplexes have bathrooms above bathrooms above bathrooms. Because your you know, plumbing is all yeah. in one center, in one place, you know, your stack, whatever, everything's following. Yeah. And if you can lay it out with your bathroom wall backs onto your kitchen wall, so you have yeah. one kind of main stack going up that takes care of all of it at once. Yeah. That's... Uh, and your electrical you panel, it. you know, you make sure that it's on the right side of the property, not not like, not exactly the the right and left. I mean, the yeah. correct side, yeah. yeah. So that you know that when you know, because when the the uh, the the hydro layout, uh, when they do the hydro layout to come and connect, they want to make sure that the uh, panel is on the side of the driveway, and they, so you want to make sure that your underground isn't as far, because that's going to cost you way more in wire. But then inside the building too, your electric panel does it. It has to be close enough to the kitchen, because that's where you have the most wires running through. Um, so you have to kind of design that strategically. Same thing with the HVAC. If you're doing, um, gas heating, well, your ductwork, you're going to have a bunch of ductwork everywhere. How are you going to make it work? So we're always being mindful of the systems and making sure they're as compact and um, strategically placed as possible. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's really great. Yeah. And, and what you're saying about ICF forms, it's, it's so true that I mean, modern building code already requires very high levels of insulation value. Like, not yeah. not only do you put in what is R twenty and the walls, but then you also have to um, insulate the outside of the building, uh, or basically you have to insulate separately so that the framing doesn't allow heat transfer through the through the the studs. Which we, you, that was never in in the past, right? Building code has increased so much. That's part of what's added to construction costs too. Yeah, and especially if you're doing electric heating, then it's a whole different uh, SB package they call it. So then you're yes, you're you have to have more R value. You have to have origin foam on your wall, right? So you there, there's a bit more. Except if you're doing renovations and you're technically grandfathered in, so you may not have to follow that. But as a new yeah. construction, if you're doing electrical heating, it's a different type of package, and there it is more airtight than uh, gas heating. So yeah. Yeah, I mean the heat pumps are getting more and more popular. There's like been that government program mm-hmm. recently. I, I think for those in Ontario, well, this will probably come out after that. I think you have until until March sometime to get your energy audit in if you want to do a retrofit to uh, get a heat pump rebated by the government. So yeah, that's only for existing properties, though it doesn't uh, count for new construction. Yeah, we're doing those on a few flips. We're trying to get the for sure. I would uh, do the same. Really. Yeah, basically for the cost of an AC unit, we can have a heat pump installed because of the rebate. So. But it's still advertise it for sale with a heat pump. Yeah, definitely. But it's still a complicated process to have. Like we installed solar panels on our house. We did the application back in May. I still haven't gotten the grant. Um, so just keep that in mind. That yeah, it sounds all nice, but I don't know when you're gonna get it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, us will be long sold probably before we get yeah. the money back. Yeah, but exactly. Yeah, government. We will, that's we will get it. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. Awesome. Well, let's, I know I asked a lot of questions, but I, I, I love the construction side and the renovation side. And um, I think that's part of one of the good uses of my time is figuring out how to build cheaper. Because again, I mean, I spend millions of dollars a year in construction. Like it's, yeah. if I could save 10%, you know, find a way to save 10% on that. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars easily. Well, and especially with today's, like I was saying, with today's interest rate and the approval not being what it was, 
you have to focus on cheap construction or else you're going to be leaving way too much money in the deal and it may not be worth it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Before we move on to the next segment, um, do you build anything bigger than triplexes? Have you built anything bigger than triplexes? Yeah, we our, our thing has usually been fourplexes. Uh, so we've okay. done a lot of fourplexes and uh, triplexes have just been recent. Um, but uh, we are working on a development project. It's supposed to be a bigger, like we have a big lot um, a 2.5 acre or something like that. We're supposed to do like 24 units on that. And then we have like our friend owns the lot right next to us. And he's doing the exact same project. So we're kind of splitting the cost of civil engineering and all that stuff together. Um, but yeah, we're supposed to do like in three phases, maybe one building of a nine unit, then another nine unit, then a six unit. And do it in phases until we fill up all the units. But now we're reworking that strategy. We might do it a little differently. We might start with a six might um anyways we're, we're trying to see how we're going to do that uh, a lot of people say oh you should just do one big 24 unit you know more units under one roof it's not the same thing for this property because um there's a lot of uh we, we have to have septic fields so it's not where there are sewers available um and then you have to do it, it's just there's a lot more you know complexity to it so we're trying to do it in phases and uh but we're we're hoping to break down break ground in 2025 on that one I don't know if that's going to happen. <laughs> it's taken some time. You definitely, um, I know I mentioned before filming, but um, we had, uh, I believe his episode came out uh, near the end of January, but we had Mark Amiot on the show and he was talking about he's building some, I believe a 20 and a 22 unit in Ottawa. Nice, cool. Uh, so definitely, we should uh, yeah, get in touch with him. For sure. Um, and and for him to get advice from you too, I'm sure both of you yeah, maybe. can provide value to each other. Um, okay, let's move on to the next segment of our show. Can you tell me about the best deal you've ever done? Yeah, so super hard for me to pick one because there are three that I think are really cool. There was one where it was actually a traditional burr that we bought, renovated. Uh, it was like a side-by-side -side semi. Uh, we renovated, we divided it, and then sold one and then the other, and we made like a ton of cash on that. And then there's another one where it's just super cool building where like a, it's a cool a cool project where it was a, a construction that we did a duplex and then we converted into a triplex so that one's just best in terms of coolness factor and then there's a third one where it's the best in terms of cash flow it cash flows a lot um so which one do you want <laughs> uh, well uh one i'd like i'd like something that you're comfortable sharing the numbers on and two um whichever one you think the audience will learn the most lessons from because that's okay. we learn the lessons from people's experience yeah, so then the coolness factor is the one that's uh, that I'm gonna go with. So that one, um, okay. So that one, we bought the land. You want like the breakdown on how it happened and the numbers? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. So it's like a deal, a deal deep dive. Um, so we bought the land for sixty thousand dollars, and it was in a, a good location, a prime location. Like those lots now are worth two hundred and some above. Oh. Um, so and it was. And did you buy that on the MLS? No. So that was a not a friend, but like a contact like through our network someone who i was starting just starting to post on instagram what we were doing and i was advertising it just through friends and family and um like it was a, a friend of a friend and a brother-in-law of that friend anyways someone far away knew what we were doing and called us up and said i'm buying this property where it's a double wide lot and it's a like i'm he's going to renovate the house and sell it but he's like i could divide a piece of lot and sell it to you and so that for him is making extra cash um so he was just going under contract on that and he called and said are you interested and we said, sure. He's like, how? we asked him how much he wanted. He said, how about 60K? And we were like, oh, sold? Because even back then, that was a great deal. Um, so we just took, you know, we asked him how big the lot would be. I went on my my design software and I figured out it took a footprint. Can I build this? I, I reworked it. Yes. And then I went to the city. Can I do this? Yes. Perfect. Cool. Let's buy it. So uh, we bought that. We got a, like the traditional construction loan. Back in the day, we were still under the personal side. So it was a little bit easier. But we got the construction loan where basically they will lend you for the lot and but you have a year to put the shovel in. Um, so we did that and then we built a duplex. So basically it's a single family home with a basement unit. Um, okay. And because we couldn't do any more on that property, like for zoning was restricted. It was still pretty small. Um, so that's what we did. It didn't cash flow much. I think the the mortgage on it was like 301. And um, I don't remember the rents back then, but we maybe cash flowed about $400 a month. Um, and like, if that, uh, and we have a minimum threshold, like we tried to, to cash out $300 a door. So this one was beneath it, but it was a good location. And we're like, it's still going to appreciate really well. So we're keeping it. And then, so fast forward five years later. So this year, when we were due to renew our, um, 
interest or, or, or um, interest rate. Um, we had to renew the mortgage and we we're like, oh my God, when we renew this, we're going to go from like a 3% to like a 6%. That, that $300 or $400 cash flow we had is going to be gone. It's going to be wiped out. Mm -hmm. um, so, but then luckily at the same time, Bill 23 came out where you can add secondary dwelling units to properties that might already have a secondary dwelling unit on it, especially with this one, because it's fully serviced by um, sewers and water. We were able to do that. So we went to the city, we asked them if we could. At first we were told no, we kept, we went back, no, no, no. We uh, we have a consultant too that we, uh, that we hire. We asked him for his input. He said, no, you can't do it. And then um, I don't remember how anyways, um, somehow we realized that it is doable. And we, we asked them like, why, can I do it on this property? Can't do it on that. And it was finally, I don't remember exactly how it happened, but we did get the approval. We were, so we kept like, we kept on them. And um, Rob had the genius idea of removing the roof from that building. So you cut at the studs and you, you take a crane and you take the roof and you shove it on the front lawn. And then you build up another um, floor on top and then you take the roof back and you throw it back on top. So that's what we did. Uh, so super cool. And uh, we did it just like the, the mortgage was due to renew in October. So we did that during the summertime and we had it rented for September 1st. So just before we had all our rents, our leases in, and we were able to refinance. Um, the cons the renovation on cost on that was 145,000, I think. And, uh, but we had it reevaluated. It was now worth 900,000. And I believe- so, so let's go back to the numbers. You you bought it, you bought the lot for 60. Yeah. Do you know what you spent approximately to build the the initial duplex? Uh, it was 80%. Uh, I think it was 301. That was the mortgage. Yeah. So 301. 301,000. And is that including the land? Yes. Okay. So yeah. about 240,000 to build. Right. Yeah. And okay. uh, the value was at 390. If I remember correctly, I would have to pull out those numbers and know exactly. But yeah, 390. Estimate, though, fine. Yeah. yeah. So that was in 20. And then you spent another 145K. Yeah. So you're in it, uh, let's call it 450K. Yeah, it and, was a little bit more than less than that. I think we were at four thirty five uh, okay. in total. By the yeah, exactly four thirty five. So maybe my numbers yeah. are off there. I'd have to have to somewhere around there. We're yeah, so somewhere around there. Yeah. But I I do remember we were at four thirty five in total, and then um, the bank. Um, so we were valued at nine hundred, and then with again with the interest rates and because we had existing releases in it where they were lower than what like today's average was. We didn't get as much in terms of financing, right? So we only got four twenty five on it uh, as a more like as a refinance, but still we were able to pay it all back. It cost us maybe ten k, um, but now the property cash flow is like a thousand dollars a month. So we are back at our three hundred dollars a minimum uh, a door. And you have a significant amount of equity in it. I'm, exactly. It, it might be worth a little less than that nine hundred now. I don't even know, uh, just because the market's gone down. But I don't even know. But, oh no, it's but, not because we have a. I think it's like very much right at the level because there's another triplex in the outskirts of that town where there's no sewer services that sold recently for 800 and high 800s. I think it was 875 or something like that. So we know that 900 were still, we're still legit. Plus, so you have a ton of equity in it. Yes. And it plus the uh, basement great. unit is turning over now. Like the guy rented for 1300 and he's leaving and I'm re-renting it for 16 or 1700. So um, yeah, so it's definitely going to be worth what it, what they're saying. Yeah. Nah, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Um, what lessons did you learn from this one? Uh, keep pushing when something when someone says that it can't be done. Keep trying to uh, get that approval or keep thinking, working the system. Like there are ways to do it. Uh, so don't give up if someone says that you can't do it right away. And that's that's Rob's thing. That's Rob's superpower. When he says when, when he's told that he can't do something, he's like, really? I'm gonna figure out a way that I can do it. So that's that's his <laughs> superpower. Um, and, um, and what else? I mean, yeah, it was, it was really cool to just do something different than a new construction, like to take off that roof and put it on the, we had a, like the street was filled with spectators just looking at the show, of their crane being lifted Where'd off and put the roof on the front lawn. There, it was, there was room. Okay. There was some room. So some of it was in the street. We were blocking half the street. We had cones around it. We had to find like two days of full sun. And luckily the first week of May was full sun. So we did it during that time and we had to block off half the street with cones uh, just overnight. So they did it really fast. They built up the roof and the, the roof was off for only like, I think 24 hours or maybe it was 36 hours. Like it wasn't long there. Maybe Yeah, yeah. the framing is quick, but that's, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. I, I may use that one day because I've always thought, oh, I have to add a floor to the house, which means I lose my roof. Yeah. And I have to tear it off and then 
build a new roof, reshingle it. Yeah. Like new trusses, new framing, everything, reshingle it. And instead you could actually tear it off, put it on the lawn, save it, and put it back on. Yeah. And I mean, yes, you're spending thousands on a crane, but oh, versus the cost it. of a new roof. It was yeah. so worth it. And like, and maybe it's not done. It, it can't be done on every house. Like if you're looking at a large bungalow with a lot of sections to the roof, then probably it's not worth it. But in this case, it was a very much square. might even be able to cut the roof in half. Yeah, well, that's what we did. We actually had to cut oh. the roof in half. It had to okay. be like maybe maybe two thirds of it was cut down uh, and in a big chunk. And then they took the other smaller half. And that's the part that was like laid out in the street. I have a video on my Instagram if people want to check it out. It's oh, super cool. I don't know if I saw that. That's yeah. yeah. Oh, it went, uh, it went oh, well, not viral, but I had a lot of likes and, and comments on that one. People thought it was really cool. Um, nice. Yeah. Okay. So that's a great lesson. One, you can tear the roof off the house and keep it. Yeah. Uh, and two, the, don't, yeah. I mean, the city always isn't always right. Like sometimes they'll tell you you can't do stuff and you're like, uh, I think you're wrong. Yeah, well, Sorry. I think what the way we we convinced them is that we weren't changing the footprint at all. So we were like, the footprint isn't changing, the parking isn't changing. Like, yeah, we had to we had to enlarge the parking by a bit, um, but like we made the design work that it we were still within all the setback requirements. So I'm like, so we told them like, why can't this be done? But again, Bill 23 is very brand new. They're still writing their own legislation on it. Like the province is letting the municipalities do their own legislations, and they're they're passing their own stuff for it. So. Um, it might be different. Like it's already changing in our municipality. They're changing a few things with that, which is pissing me off. And I might actually contact the mayor on that. But uh... <laughs> well, and some some cities are going to make rules around Bill Twenty Three that aren't even allowed. That's what um, they're doing. Yeah. I find that that's what they're doing right now, and it's only because neighbors complain. They don't want fourplexes as their neighbors. But you know what? Too bad neighbors. That's, that's what, what the, the world wants. Yeah, yeah, it's more that's housing, more need. affordability. Yeah. It's better for the environment too because it's more dense housing. And I'm sorry, but that's the way of the future. So suck it up. That's yeah, my message exactly. to everyone. I completely <laughs> agree with you. <laughs> um, all right, let's move on to the worst or your least favorite deal that you've ever done. So my worst uh, deal was that condo that we bought because okay. condos suck. They the the uh, the condo fees just keep rising. You got to deal with the board members. Um, and uh, I mean, it was a basement unit condo in an outskirt town in a small town. So I mean, it didn't appreciate very much. We sold it. I think we still like we had paid down the mortgage. So we still ended up like forty thousand dollars, but it wasn't like in terms of like purchase price and selling. I think we bought it for one eighty five and we sold it for like two thirty five, or I don't even remember what it was. But it wasn't the best deal. And I I learned that I'm never gonna buy another condo. Like I don't want to deal with the board. All it's just too much like bureaucracy, right? So that wasn't for me. Um, maybe if you're in downtown areas, then it could be worth it. But uh, for where it was, it wasn't worth it. Um, but then the other, like maybe worst deal is the, the triplex we're doing now because we have, we actually have to leave money in the deal and we've never had to do that before. So for us, it's, it hurts to leave money in a deal. We always pull money out usually and we pay ourselves with that. Um, so again, because of the interest rate being higher, but we're hoping that by the time we're done construction, which will be like in April. And by the time we, because after a construction in Ontario, you have to wait uh, 60 days for the, um, uh, what is it called? The, uh, it's not a cool down period, but anyways, you have to wait 60 days before they make sure that there's no lien on the property and then you can pull out your full mortgage. So we're hoping by, like, by the time all of that rolls over, um, maybe it's just the five-year fixed, the projection of the five-year fixed, maybe we'll have gone down a bit and maybe we can pull out a little bit more and not have to leave as much. So it's a full burr in terms of equity value. Yeah. It's not in terms of how much you can pull out on your, your borrowing. Sorry, I didn't so, understand that. Like, um, if you took 80% of the appraised value, it would in theory be a full burr. It's just that yes. you're, the bank's not going to give you 80% because of current interest rate. Exactly. It's more like they're giving us 55% yeah. so of the value. But the construction value, like it's not costing us that much to build, right? So we're, yep. we're, our cost to build is like 550 or something, but they're, might, they're probably only going to only gonna give us 500000 um, so we're going to be leaving money in, but it's still going to cash flow well because it's going to have a, a smaller mortgage. So depends on your goals. Like some people are okay with that. It still has a decent ROI. It's still going to have like a 20 some percent ROI, right? Um, because it's still going to have a decent cash flow. Um, but I just hate leaving money in a deal. I like to recuperate my money and some and then use that to do the next one. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, that's still a pretty good win. And I think on the on the condo, um, I think that's a really good lesson for you to have learned. And I think for people who are handy, understand the construction, have the ability to manage renovations, even if they don't do it themselves, um, I think that's a good lesson because you you lose control and, and all 
and all of that. I think for some people who are completely new to renovations, don't have the time to learn it, don't want to learn it, a condo can be very low maintenance. Yes, there can still be issues with the condo board. Um, though I do feel some fears around like, well, there could be a special assessment. I've seen special assessments on condos. It's like, yeah, all of the siding on a lot of the, let's say these townhouses, uh, we found water was running behind them. There's a bunch of wood rot. Okay, well, what if I owned a detached and water was running behind the siding? There was a bunch of wood rot. Yeah. I would have to probably pay the same thing to fix it anyway. So special assessment's typically there for a reason. The the only place it's an issue is where it's being mismanaged. Really. That's like, what I was going to say. If you're going to buy a condo, there's nothing wrong with that, but make sure that they already have those studies in place because and that it's being managed correctly. Um, hopefully, like it's it's legit registered and all that because um, you know that's a whole different subject. But if you look at the condos in Florida where they were never managed, they were never asked for engineering reports, and now a bunch of them like, they they like they they fell down they they fell down. yeah or or they're going to be underwater in I don't know how many years so they're being all reassessed right now and all the condo fees are skyrocketing and people are trying to sell and get out of it they they won't be able to get insurance and so like that's like a whole condo nightmare that I wouldn't want to live we shouldn't deal with that in Ottawa but just make sure it's well managed and they have their assessments in and that they have their projections of what the condo fees are going to be uh, in the next five years or something. But I think all of that comes back to what we talked about. Know your superpower, know your strengths. Yeah. And that helps you understand um, kind of what area, what you should be working on. Mm -hmm. and so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, all right. I'll, let's go on to the final segment of the show. Um, first question. What has changed about your approach to real estate investing with your experience? Um, managing my, um, my, my mental health. Like I used to have a lot of anxiety when I first started investing. It is complicated. It's stressful. Um, you know, I had less units than I do today and I was more stressed because I was spending too much um, head time, you know, like I, I was thinking too much about my tenants and my rentals. And, and um, so it's really important to have your systems in place to make everything as automatic as possible. So now that's what we try to do is systems, automation, super important, like increasing automation, increasing systems is like the number one thing on our goal board. And, um, and so that helps automatically that helps manage your mental health and your anxiety. I haven't had a panic attack in years ever since I've had my son. It's just because everything's being more, it's easier, but it's, it's just being managed better. So, um, so that's the first thing. Yeah. I would say just, you know, increasing and, and hiring it's okay to hire we used to be you know we're all about DIYing doing everything yourself but at a certain point you can't that's not sustainable you have to hire and you have to be confident that that person can handle the tasks too like I used to be I could we just hired a, an admin recently and in the beginning I was like okay I have to, I felt like I had to find the solution before handing them over the task if that makes sense mm -hmm. like I have to figure it out and then and then tell them okay and now execute it but now it's like it's that's not how it is. It's more I want you to execute this, so you need to find the solution of how to execute it. So you just kind of assign the task, you let them do it, and if they're smart enough, and if you know they will figure it out. And my admin is super intelligent. And he's like, I give him something. Okay, I need to have this problem solved, figure it out, and so he just runs with it and he figures it out, right? Then he executes the plan. So, um, so yeah, I think it's really um, that's one of the things that my approach is is like, you know, having systems in place and relying more. Uh, heavily on on other people to take care of stuff for you and help you out and um, what you're talking about reminds me a little bit of that um a meme or a picture of two wolves and there's like a baby wolf with one arrow in it and it's like collapsed on the floor and then you have a, a an adult wolf that has like a dozen arrows in its back and it's standing up strong and it's just we become stronger and we're able to handle more issues with time and, and they just become less significant of issues yeah, as long as you know how to manage them properly, right? And and put your systems in place. Yeah, because if you just keep going the way you're going and you keep just accumulating those arrows and falling slightly, then you'll you'll burn down and you'll quit. That's how a lot of investors I speak to I, I I there's a lot of people that I need that, oh yeah, I used to be a landlord. I gave up all that. It was too much trouble and it's because you didn't have the right systems in place and you didn't you didn't see it through, right? So that's yeah. really important. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, next question. If you could go back in time, what's one piece of advice you'd have for a younger you? Um, I would say uh, uh, be be careful how you treat other people because you never know when you're going to have to coexist or work with them in the future. So I'm, I'm talking even high school, right? You can go back to high school where 
you, you know, high school, there's, there's, there's a whole other world. Um, but you never know when you're going to meet these people again in the future and actually have a professional relationship with them. So it's something that I want to teach my son is, you know, always be respectful to others. You never know what other people are going through and always just make friends everywhere you go because it's your network is the most important thing. So you, there's no point in having enemies, enemies in life. So it's one thing I would, I would tell that's it's, it's the, the most important thing that I want to teach my son. So it's, you know, something I would tell myself too. <laughs> nice. All right. Last question. What is the most overlooked or the most overhyped investing strategy right now? Oh God, I don't know. I don't, I don't follow TikToks. I don't look at videos. I don't know what the hype is. I don't care. <laughs> so I, I don't know. You tell me what is the most hype. Well, I, I think in this context, your strategy is one of the most overlooked. You don't hear about a lot of people doing it. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's... And I think for people who have the skill set or can get the skill set, it, it could be an excellent strategy. Uh, yeah, for for a long term real estate investing to build a significant portfolio. Yeah, you're right. It is in terms of overhyped though. I don't know. You said over well, over the other overhyped. Okay, okay. Or overhyped. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Natalie, I know you mentioned it earlier, but how can people find out more about you? Yeah. So that uh, website um, at the New Build Couple. I'm reworking it a bit. It's it's, it's dated, but. Um, my Instagram is where I'm at the most. Um, I'm very active on that. So you can send me a message, a DM through Instagram at the new build couple. Awesome. Thanks for coming on, Natalie. Thank you for having me.